Okay, good afternoon. Um, I am uh, Laurent Rosenfeld. I am the author of this book, Think Pearl 6. It's a very good book, and you can buy it from Wendy outside. And she has a very good price, actually. She gets a better price than what I get from the publisher, so <laughs> take the opportunity. Now, predictably, since I wrote this book, I will speak about Pearl 6. But as you will see, a lot of what I'm going to say also applies to Pearl 5, actually. <clears throat> so I will start with uh, something which I have uh, learned from Mark, Jason, Dominus. Let's stop writing C in Pearl. You know, there's an old saying that says that for tra for train programmer can write for train program in any language. And that's qu quite often what we do. We write C in, uh, in Perl. Many of us do, and I have, I have been doing it for quite a while. I'm trying to cure myself, but I'm still doing it sometime. So in his very good book, Higher Order Perl, Mark Jason Dominus says that we, we're, writing programs in, uh, we're writing C programs in Perl, and this is really a pity because um, Perl is much, much more expressive than C, and we can do many, many things that a C programmer wouldn't even dream of. Um, Perl uses a lot of concepts which are borrowed from the functional programming, especially Lisp, as far as Perl 5 is concerned, Haskell, as far as Perl 6 is concerned, and that allows us to make programs which are um, shorter, more expressive, more efficient, maybe not more efficient in terms of, uh, of the speed, but more efficient in terms of how quickly we write the program. Um, and yeah, we can even say that Perl is semantically closer to Lisp than to C, even though the syntax is probably closer to C. So what, now when uh, Mark Jason Dominus was writing that, he was speaking about Perl 5. Um, and his book has really changed my way of, of, of coding. I'm, I'm really a different person since I read his book, and, I, and, um, and not only in Perl. But now what I want to do is applying the same idea of higher order Perl to Perl 6. Now I have only 45 minutes, so I'm not going to do everything that Mark Chazen Dominus does in his 450 or 500 page book. I will only make a very small subset of it. Uh, now, as I said at the beginning, a lot of what I will be showing applies to Perl 5 and Perl 6. Sometimes the syntax will be, well, the syntax will be Perl 6, but sometimes you can just change one or, one or two small things and have exactly the same thing in Perl 5. And then there are a few things which are new to Perl 6, because Perl 6 are more, has more programming, functional programming features than Perl 5 has. So what is, what is functional programming? It's very difficult to say. I mean, every person you ask a question will have a different answer. So b because of that, I will just give some answers. None of them is sufficient to, to say what functional programming, but if you take them together, I think you get a pretty good idea. So programming, functional programming is about is a, is a programming is a sorry, it's a programming paradigm that treats computation as the evaluation evaluation of mathematical function. That is, you you have you use an expression. You don't use a statement essentially. You use an expression. It returns you a value, and whenever you um, you try again the same function with the same parameters, you're supposed to get the same results. So we're doing that with expression rather than statements or instructions. As I said, the output value of a subroutine is supposed to be always the same. There are, there are a few exceptions, like the RAND subroutine or things like that. There isn't supposed to be any side effect, except maybe printing things to the screen and this type of thing. And uh, functional programming is about stateless program. 
Imag immutable values. Don't use variables, you use constants, right? Symbolic computation. And then there are all, a lot of things here. It's just a list of things that you find in, in functional programming. Higher order functions, list processing, pipeline processing, iterators, anonymous function, lambdas, closures, etc. So we'll just see just a few of them. Um, list operators. So many pearls operator, many per operators work on list or produce list. So I've, here I've named quite a few of them. As you can see, most of them you find in Perl 5. Join, split, print, say if you, have, if you use a feature, sort for map grabs. All these exist in Perl 5. And then there are a few more which, which I have put there. There are many more than that, but a few more which are specific to Perl 6, like comp, reduce, gather and take, and, and then there's a whole series of um, meta operators and hyper operators. So the, the great thing about list processor, list processing, list operators is that they can be chained to create a data pipeline so that you can have, create a, a pipeline where each, each step is doing incremental changes to the data. So here I've just given four examples of uh, ways to find even number which are smaller than 15. Um, the first two, well, the first one use map and join and the range operator. This one you can just use it exactly like, like that in Perl 5, except that you have to remove the comma after the closing brace. Otherwise, it's just about the same. For the grep, the second one, the grep, is also almost the same in Perl 5. You, you also have to remove the comma and then, then and then you have a new operator here, percent percent, but you can replace that with percent uh, two uh, equal equal zero, and, and you get the same result. Um, then in Perl six, the third one is in Perl six. Here, uh, it's just doing this, the same thing, but with a syntax which goes the other way around, from left to right instead of right to left. Uh, this is called the feed operator. Um, so it's, it's just doing the same thing, but the other way around. Uh, the, it is supposed to, I don't think it's implemented yet in Rakudo, but uh, if you're using this operator, it is supposed to be possible one day to have the, the various part operate on different CPU or on different cores of the same CPU, so it auto parallelizes the, the processing. I don't think it's implemented yet. At least it wasn't implemented a year ago when I looked in detail, and I don't think it has been implemented since. Um, and then, uh, then, yeah, you can also use a, a chain of method instead of a chain of functions, and it works more or less the same way. This is the last example. Um, now, functions like map and grep are very interesting, and, and sort also, because they, use, uh, because they use a code block as a parameter, or a subroutine as a parameter to define what they do to the data. Basically, let's say map doesn't do very much. It's just take every piece of data and apply something to it. Now, the interesting thing is the something, because this is a function that, we, that you will pass as a parameter to map, and it can be any function that you can, uh, or, or, or actually a function or, or an operation. Uh, so map and grep, in that sense, are just generic functions, abstract functions. Um, the, and, uh, the, the real interesting part is what you pass as, an, as a first argument to, to them. So now, when a code block and a subroutine can be a parameter or a return value for, um, uh, for, for another subroutine or another function, we speak about higher order functions. Uh, or sometimes you also use the word first class functions. And now, why would you want to use higher order functions? So here I have a small example of a little piece of code to, um, to browse the directory tree and print the name of the files that it finds in the directory tree. So you could, this is, this is Perl 6 syntax, but you could just do almost the same thing uh, in Perl 5 with just having to change uh, the syntax for the for uh, loop 
and a couple of other things, but it's basically, you can do exactly the same. Now, uh, so what it does here in the for loop, uh, it looks at every entry that, is, that it's finding in the directory. If the entry is a file, then you print the file. Is, if the entry is a directory, then you recurse. You call the same function on the directory in order to, to go the next step into the tree. Uh, this is good and fine, but now if I want to find the total size of my five, I just have to rewrite the, the whole subroutine again because, it, because it's not aimed at doing that. It's just aimed at printing the, the, the five. Now, if I want to delete the TMP file, I have to rewrite the subroutine again. If I want to archive all the file, same thing. And that's bad. We want to reuse code. And that's why I, I own the function are useful. Because what we can do here, we have another version of, this, of the Traverse Deer um, subroutine, version number two. And what we do here, if you look at the parameter, we're passing two parameters. Before we had only one, the path. Now we have two parameters, a code ref and a path. And why do we do that? Because then we can use a code ref on the entry uh, if the entry is a file. And uh, what's this code ref? Well, it's uh, the line before the last on my screen, uh, the sub print file, and it's just uh, take a, an argument which is a file and print the, and print the file. And now on the last line, I'm calling Teresa Deer and I'm passing as an argument print file or reference to print file. And, uh, and the path where I want to, to do the thing. And uh, so now, I, don't, I no longer have to change Tarasd if I want to do something else with it, because I, have the, because I, have, I can pass the, as an argument, as a first argument to Tarasd, I can pass the, a function, like print file in that case, or in that other case, I am passing, um, uh, a code block, a code block, which is just computing uh, the, the total size of the files. So print file or whatever I have, I'm passing as an argument in this one, is is usually called a, a callback. In, that's why we can use now Tarasdia to 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 measure the size occupied by the files on the on the directory tree or to do any other things, to archive all the files, to, to delete temp files, and so on. So anonymous subroutines, a callback function like the one we've seen, can be named. This is what we had in the first example of Tarius Dia 2. Uh, and this is what we have here. We, we are, we are using, we are we're defining on the th second line of the code a, a, a grid subroutine, the grid subroutine just say hello world, and then we're defining a do twice subroutine, which is just calling, calling its argument twice, the argument is a function, it's calling twice, and then I do twice grid, and I'm just going to print hello, hello world twice. Um, callback functions can also be anonymous subroutine. Uh, so here, instead of Instead of uh, defining a grid subroutine, I'm just defining an anonymous subroutine, sub say hello world, and storing it into a variable called grid2. And then I do twice grid2, and I get the same result. Prints hello world twice. We can, I can even pass a subroutine directly without giving it even a variable name. This is what we, we have in the third example. Do twice sub say hello world and that will do the same thing as before. And in this case, the subroutine is very simple because it doesn't have any argument. So you ca I can even use a bear block instead of using a, a sub. So do twice, open uh, curly, say hello world, close curly, and that will do the same thing as before. And, um, well, that's it. Yeah, it's just here another example with a code block uh, reduce. Uh, so this example was there because in this case we have two arguments and we are able 
nonetheless to use the two arguments uh, because uh, dollar caret A and dollar caret B are uh, positional parameters. Uh, so even though I haven't any signature, uh, I can use them as, uh, as, uh, as parameters for my, for my code block. I think I made a mistake here. This is the same that you have already seen. Lambdas, well, what are lambdas? <laughs> um, yeah, the reduced example which we have here is actually, is actually a lambda. A lambda is just a nameless function or if you want an anonymous function. Uh, so the, here is another example of a lambda. Uh, dot say for map dot tc and then a list of uh, European capitals and each of the capitals will be printed with a capital, uh, with an initial capital letter. Uh, this is also a lambda because uh, there is no, there, it's a function which has no name. Uh, here's another example of a lambda, uh, which is somewhat similar to what we've seen before. My even numbers, my Auerbach events uh, equals uh, grep and then you take numbers from 1 to 17, and, you, and among them, you pick only those which are even, those which are evenly divided by, um, by 2. The, uh, the pointy block syntax, which I have used uh, twice here for, dis for displaying a multiplication table, is also a lambda. So what, what, what we do here is for, for 1 to 9, and then we declare an argument uh, called uh, mult, say the multiplication table for that argument is, and then, and then a nested for one to nine val, and then we print mult uh, times val equal mult times val. Um, so this is also lambda. Closures is another keyword for functional programming. A closure is a function that can access the lexical variables that were available to it when it was defined. So here I have an example. Um, Subcreate counter. Uh, I get a parameter called count, and then uh, then I just, for various reasons, uh, uh, create a new variable called counter, which I which I am set equal to, to the to the parameters I have received count, and then I create a, a small sub called increment count and which only returns counter and then increments counter. And at the end, I return uh, uh, this, this uh, subroutine which I have just written. And that, that will work and will uh, print, if I do count from five and pass at number five, and then call, the, call this function uh, six times, it will print the numbers from five, to, from five to 10. Now, I made it a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. The reason for it is I wanted to give a number to the sub I was creating. This increment count uh, subroutine uh, has a name. And the reason I wanted to do that is because many people think that closure has have to be anonymous subroutine. I just wanted to show that it can be actually a name subroutine. Having said that, I must say that usually uh, you use it with anonymous subroutine. So, as I said, the example was a little bit contrived because I wanted to show a name closure, but closures don't need to be named, don't, but, and, most, and are generally anonymous. Now, the interesting thing about closure is, is that it is possible to create functions dynamically at runtime. So here, here's an example with a little bit more code. So I just have a, a, more or less the same thing as before, but with an, an anonymous closure this time. So, it's, so, so this create counter function creates, a, creates a, a function at runtime. And then I call it, what is it, uh, two times. I first call it with number five, and then I call it with number 10, and I give a different name to the, to, the, to the dynamically created subroutine that I receive. One is 
count from five and the other one count from 10. And what happens here is that I really have two different subroutines, both created by the same create counter. And they, and they can work in parallel without, without uh, uh, mixing one with each other. So the count from five, for instance, will count from five to 10 here, and then, then I count, then I call count from 10, and it will, uh, and it, and it will uh, start by 10, 11, and 12. So what we have done here with the same one subroutine creating several functions, we've created a function factory. And we can create as many counter functions as we need just by calling the create counter subroutine. And this can be used with, in a dispatch table. Um, as an example, I've just created a function factory for the alphabet. So I, what I want to do is to split a file containing a list of words into 26 files, one file for each letter of the alphabet. So I'm just creating one uh, function, create sub, which will uh, and which receives one letter of the alphabet as a as a parameter, and it will create a file. It will open the file w uh, with that letter. The file will be letter underscore and the letter, and return a, a sub. And then then I uh, w then what I do is I loop from A to Z uh, for each letter, and I just create 26 functions that will. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm creating a dispatch table of 20, with 26 letters, each letter, uh, for, each letter of the value, for each letter of the value in this, uh, in this hash is the function. So this is good and fine. This, this example I used on a, on, on a list of 118,000 uh, words, uh, which is a list of all the words accepted for crossword puzzles and other, and other things, and I, and I could dispatch everything into 26 files. In some cases, you, maybe you don't want to create all the, all, the, all the files at the beginning, because maybe some you will not need. If your list is not 113,000 as my list, but if your list has 10 words, you probably don't want to create 26 files if you're going to use only a, a small part of it. So you can also do it dynamically, which is what I have done here. Here is just, now this we have seen, sorry, here. Here, you know, I have a list of, what is it, four words, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Zulu. And, uh, and I want to put them in different, uh, different files. But I don't want to create a, a file for, for letter D or for letter F, because there is no word starting with letter D or letter F. So I'm just creating the, I'm creating the function dynamically when I need it. So if I, see, if I see the first letter of a word, which is A, I first check that I already, if I have already a function for letters starting with, with a let, for a word starting with letter A. If I don't, I create it. If, I, if it's created, then I use it, and that's it. In doing, so it, it, the interesting thing is that it shows that it's really dynamically created when I need it. If I don't need it, if I, ne if I never need a function for letter uh, H, then I, then I will not create a, a file for that, and I will not create a function for that. Iterators. Uh, so suppose I want to create a function like map, but that would process it one, one item at a time when the consuming process is, when the consumer process wants to have it. I can start by building an iterator with a closure. So create iterator, and then I'm just uh, uh, using an index, which is uh, incremented each time I'm using it. And then, and then, I, then I use it uh, as follows, sub item map, uh, and I return the code ref. Um, so this thing is so it's it's like map, but it's doing uh, one at a time whenever I need one, and the, the the reason for doing that that's very interesting. It's because I can then use the iterator on infinite list. 
So here, the first code line says, my iterator will create iter one dot dot star. That means I'm really creating an iterator from one to infinity. And it works because Perl is not going to create a, an infinite list because that would be quite bad. But it will just uh, prepare it so that when I'm using iterMap before, it will just pick one element, one item at a time. And it will continue to do so for a very long period. Uh, so, the, yeah, the code that I have shown with just very minor change would work in, in Perl 5. Like here, um, the one thing you will need to change is to remove the comma after the closing brace. And then you don't have the star operator for infinity, but you could presumably put a very large number. Uh, Perl 6 has a sequence operator, three dots, which allows to create a list uh, in a more diversified way. So my, the example is how to create an, a list of uh, even numbers. Well, you, you, what you do is you, you start the list with two values, then you put the three dot operator, the sequence operator, and you let it go to infinity. And, uh, and Pulse will look at that, will see that the first value is zero, the second value is two, and will figure out that the next value should probably be four, and then six, and so on. Uh, another thing it can do is, is if you're providing three values instead of two for the starting of the list, and here my geometric progression equals one, two, four, dot, 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 32. And Pearl will look at that and see, oh, one, two, two, four, looks like a geometric progression, so the next number should probably be eight, and then 16, 32, and so on. Um, so it will create a, a, a list in the geometric progression. Then you can also, so all this is interesting, but uh, not all interesting lists are arithmetic progression or geometric progression. So you can create other lists uh, by using a, a, a generator in the, in the dot, dot, dot uh, construct. So here, for example, I'm generating, uh, I'm, I'm, my first element in my list is one. Then, then what I'm doing is a code block, which says the next element should be that one plus two, and the next element should be that three plus two, and I let it go to 11, and uh, that makes another, this is another way of making an arithmetic progression. Uh, and then the last example here is, uh, we can also use it to create uh, an infinite list of uh, Fibonacci number, for example. I, what I'm just doing is, is first number will be zero, and second number will be one, and then, uh, and then given two numbers before, the next number will be the sum of the two numbers before. That's what $A, $B, and the code block do. And that will create uh, my Fibonacci list. Carrying, this is another basic technique of functional programming. Uh, the example there, make add, takes a takes a numeric value as a parameter and, and then returns a sub which will add the numeric value that I've got with the new parameter that I get. So the example here is uh, my add two equals make add two. So I'm passing two as a parameter. So, and then when I use add two and I pass three, it will, uh, it will add two to three and, and give me five. This you can also do uh, in Perl 5. Uh, now, this is another construction doing the same thing and a little bit more than that, and that is specifically Perl 6, using the assuming method. Uh, my, uh, I first create a normal function add, this is just for the example, which takes two parameters and returns uh, some of the two parameters. That's just, 
And then now, this is just for, for, for having something to work on. And then I'm saying my add2 equals add, the function that I just created, the subroutine that I just created, and I say assuming two. And the fact, uh, so this method called assuming two will tell, uh, uh, will tell Perl that add two will be using two parameters, but one of the parameters is the one provided by assuming two, and, then, and the other parameter will be the one that I will be passing to it. So if I do add two, five, I will get seven because, because I get five and then I have two which was passed by the dot assuming two uh, method invocation and that will work the same, same thing here. I can add four and if I call it with five, I get nine. Now you can also use another way of, uh, of using the whatever operator. Uh, which is uh, using the star operator or the whatever operator. Uh, the whatever operator is a placeholder for, for, for an argument and the expression returns a closure. So uh, the example here, I say my third equals star over three and Perl will know that now if I call third uh, with, a, with some value, it will have to divide that some value by three, so if I call it with 126, I get 42. I, I hope the math is correct. <laughs> uh, so the star operator is somewhat similar to the dollar underscore operator that you know. It has some similarity, but it's doing more things. And one of the things that is good about it, you can use it even if it's not declared, which is not possible. Uh, no, sorry, it's not what I want to say. It doesn't need to exist when you, use, when you make the declaration. Whereas, if you do that with dollar underscore, it will not work. Now, all these which I have shown are just techniques from the functional programming, but uh, which are useful. You can make ma many useful things, many expressive things with it. But I would like to bring it a little bit, a little bit further. Not just some examples of, of useful techniques, but you could really go one step further and try to use a real functional, functional programming style. This is not adapted to every problem, but there are many that will benefit and make your code much more expressive. Now, the example is the merge sort algorithm. Um, everybody knows what the merge sort algorithm is. You know, you have a list of uh, numbers uh, you just, uh, your function receives a list of uh, numbers. You just split the list in two half, and then you call the, and then you call the same function on each of the, on each of the two half list. And then when you get the result back, you just merge what you, what you just received from the, from your function call. That's, that's about it. It's very simple. It was invented in 1950 by, by John von Neumann. Uh, so this is, this is a non-functional or procedural version of the, the merge sort algorithm. I will not go further on it. I will just go straight to the functional implementation of the same. So not only is the code about twice shorter, that's not very important, but uh, these two examples I wrote um, I wrote when I was writing this book, which, by the way, is available at Wendy. <laughs> uh, and when I wrote that, it took me two and a half hours to get it right. I had off by one errors, I had other errors, and it took me two and a half hours. So that's about 150 minutes. This version took me 15 minutes. 10 times less. And it was right the first time. I mean, there was maybe a syntax mistake. I just corrected it and then it worked. Uh, so that's a big difference between functional programming and, and uh, procedural programming, really. I really spent 10 times less writing this. So not only is the code is shorter, it's, it's, it's only, it is a bit shorter, but, it's, but also if you look at it, it captures the essence of the merge sort algorithm much better. You, you look at the merge sort um, function. If, it, if what it receives, the, if the list it receives is only one 
uh, item, then it's, the list is already sorted, it just returns it. If it's more than two, if it's, if it's more than that, then you just split the list into elements. So you, you look for the more or less the middle of the list. And then you just call merge sort on the first list and on the second list. And then, uh, and then after that, you merge, you merge the two lists that you receive in return, and that's it. So it's very simple. And it, it actually captures exactly what I said at the beginning, how the merge sort works. If you, if you look at that, sorry. It's much more difficult to see that it, like, what it actually does. You really have to work your way through. Now, another example is a quick sort algorithm. Everyone knows, of course, what's the difference between merge sort and quick sort, right? Well, quick sort acts on basically the same principle as merge sort, but instead of just dividing your list in two parts, you, you just take one element from the list and you say, I will uh, split that list in two, in two different lists, one with all the elements which are smaller than the one that I have picked, and one with all the elements which are larger than that. So this element is usually called the pivot. So basically, you take a list, you, you just pick, for example, the first number, and then in this list, you just look for all the elements smaller, all the elements bigger, and you call the same uh, quick sort uh, on it. Now, I won't go further on that, but Notice that to, to be able to show the code, the non-functional implementation of Quicksort, I had to reduce the font quite significantly. I don't know if everyone can see this from the back, but it's much smaller than the other code examples I had. Now, let's look at the functional programming implementation. Six lines, seven lines if you count the closing brace. So, same thing. I don't, I don't remember how much time I spent on each of them, but it's so much faster to write that than to write the, the other one. It gives you an idea. Now, uh, and also, just as before, if you look at it, it's very f easy to see what the algorithm does. I mean, it really captures the essence of it. Uh, what you do is, if your list has one, less than one element, you return it one element or less, you return it. If not, you choose a pivot, which is any number, uh, any, any element within the list, and then you just return with grep these things. I won't go further on it. So the code is three times shorter. The functional code captures very neatly the essence of the algorithm. Now, there is a, there is a small problem with that, is that uh, the functional programming version copies data many times over instead of doing in-place sorting. So if you're going to, 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 to sort a very big list, uh, the, the first implementation will probably be faster. Uh, so you have to know that. On the other hand, because we're not, multi, we're not changing data in functional programming, you can, uh, much, it is much easier to, to, to run it in parallel on several uh, CPUs or several, or several cores of one CPU. Now, the quick sort algorithm, once again, but uh, yeah, the example I showed before were really scalar-like Perl. Now, now, now I, I want to show it in Haskell. And the, the, the interesting thing about the Haskell code which you have there is that this is used by the, by the Haskell fans has the showcase to show the show window to show how good a scale is. You see, we can we are able to implement quick sort in six lines. That's what they say all the time, and this is really the example they use. Now, if I do it in Perl six, it's just also six lines, uh, and actually, it's a bit less code if you if you count the characters. So. Yeah, I think I don't have too much time still, so uh, five minutes. Okay, I will just show one more thing then. I had, yeah, I was just talking about this uh, uh, the functional programming, non-functional programming, the speed with a large list. And uh, so I did a, a, third, a third case, which is 
running it uh, using using parallelism, using concurrency. So using actually eight cores uh, of my of my computer, and then I computed. Uh, I, I made it ten times with one thousand value. So you will see the result is a non-functional version. Is the faster? It, it, it runs in thirteen hundredths of a second. The functional uh, version is about uh, two and a half times uh, slower. So you have to take that into account. Functional programming is very useful, but if you really have a very severe performance constraints, you have to be careful. And then I, I then I also put it in. Uh, I also tried the parallel version, and the parallel version is just slightly slower than the non-functional uh, version, but uh, may maybe more or less on par, so, th so it's interesting. Now, okay. Um, well, I hope I have convinced you to, to use functional programming, but uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. No question? Okay, well, thank you. Uh, just uh, yeah, additional readings. Uh, the, the book I mentioned at the beginning, High Order Pearl by uh, Mark Chazan Dominus, it's available online, uh, but I would suggest if you're interested with it, that you probably want to buy the paper copy. That's at least what I did. I first read it online. It's a bit difficult. It's not, it's not easy, easy reading, you know, so I ended up buying the book, and I think it's a good thing to do. Then, uh, then uh, this book, which is a very good book, which you can be, which you can get from Wendy at a very low price, uh, has a, the last chapter is on functional programming in Perl six, so you can take a look at this. And these slides are available on my GitHub site. You can you can reuse them if you want, translate them, do whatever you want with it. Uh, it's just a share like license. Thank you. <laughs>